Well, that's it. Six weeks of being in Ennis, freezing cold and in the dark, wondering about how the scientists ended up on the ice, the case of NEK and the supernatural occurrences have now been answered. Well, kind of. This season of the show has lent into season one a lot in its approach, and despite there being some similarities, it was able to forge its own identity in the lead up to the season finale. I went into the finale with a lot of questions and high expectations, and I think this is a prime example of a finale that did have some really great moments within it. But there were also some elements of it that felt rushed, and that could solely be down to the fact that it only had a six episode run. So let's not wait any longer and discuss the episode whilst also breaking it down and answering all of the questions about what happened. Here is True Detective Season 4 Episode 6 Ending Explained. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. What happened to Annie Kay? The mystery around what happened to Annie Kay was something which became more of a focus than the scientists by the end of the season. But after Liz Danvers and Evangeline Navarro went into the ice cave and found Raymond Clark and interrogated him, the cave that they went down into led directly to the Salal Research Center, and they were in the exact location where Annie was killed. Once he was tied up, he revealed what happened on the fateful night after listening to the death of Annie on loop over and over again. Something which I felt like I could quite literally feel. The screams on loop sounded so painful and having to listen to somebody that you once cared for but were responsible for the death of. Nah, spine tingling. Annie was suspicious of what was going on at the Salal Research Center and one night she snuck in and found the secret passageway into the cave where the secret lab was. It was here where she found out that the researchers were digging for DNA of a microorganism that could essentially save the world in terms of illnesses and they cracked it. But in order for them to be able to essentially harvest it more efficiently, they were working with the mining company to push pollution because that very pollution softened the permafrost which meant that the mine softened and they could extract it more easily. So all of the deaths, stillbirths, poor water quality and illnesses were directly stemming from what the mining company and the research center were doing in order to extract the microorganism. They had the view of a few deaths for the sake of global impact. Once Annie found this out, she went ballistic and started destroying everything that she found, something which put the researchers back several years in their work. Whilst this was happening, Lund came down and started attacking her, and then all of the other researchers did the exact same. It was brutal, hence the sheer amount of wounds that were found on her when her body was recovered. Plus, what we found out last week with Hank saying that he moved the body, that was true. As Silver Sky sent him to move her to the storage unit, they were in on it because it was in their best interest too. Raymond Clark had the ability to see the dead and he saw Annie Kay coming back to him on several occasions. This is something what tied back to what Rose said in episode two, where she said that there were some others out there just like her. Not everybody can see the dead, but only some can, and he was one of them. He said that Annie Kay kept visiting him, so one would have to assume that at the point where he saw Annie and hid, it was timed perfectly with the group which was led by Beatrice coming in and causing havoc. With regards to Raymond Clark, on the night of the blizzard, he ended up going out onto the ice and dying in the exact same way that the other researchers did, frozen with the damaged eye and looking like he was in shock at what he saw. Was there some remorse there from him? Personally, I don't know. He lied about touching Annie to Evangeline and Liz and technically he was the person that actually killed her. So I don't think that there was. He may have loved her once, but he loved his work more. There was an interesting line that Clark said, which was, time is a flat circle. This is taken from Rust Cole in season one. And in this instance, it was mentioned about how Annie had been in the caves long before they were there and long after they'd die and that time was a flat circle and they were stuck in it. In my opinion, this line did feel a bit shoehorned in just to get another callback to season one of the show and a connection to a fan favorite character, Rust. I get it because it's basically just implying what happened before will eventually happen again, as it always has, especially with the history of the town. But I don't think that it was necessary and it doesn't really connect to the saying that well. What happened to the scientists? Now, this was the other mystery that was in the show and something that we found out about right at the end of the episode. After the blizzard had stopped and it felt like Liz and Evangeline were the closest that they'd ever been after reconciling, following Evangeline saving Liz after falling through the ice, after thinking that she saw Holden being trapped, something that had plagued her mind since the night of the accident. She thought back to something that Clark said about how he was holding onto the hatch to the entrance of the tunnel for an hour whilst he believed that Annie Kay was on the other side in the form of a spirit trying to get him. 
However, Liz was a skeptic on that and rushed to the hatch and under the UV light saw a handprint that looked familiar to her. It made them realize that they were solely thinking about who killed Annie Kay when they felt that they should have been asking the other question, the right question, who knows who killed Annie Kay? And then, after seeing the handprint with only three fingers, that led her to Beatrice's house, who they only knew because she lived with Blair. I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't really a big fan of this moment as it just felt too coincidental and deliberate. Like, I don't feel the question they should have been asking, who knows who killed Danny Kay, is like a groundbreaking Sherlock moment, but hey. It was in this scene where it was revealed to us that Beatrice and Blair found out about Annie Kay being killed by the researchers due to Beatrice stumbling across the underground tunnel. Again, something that just felt a bit too coincidental for me. And for her to then venture down there, it was something that just felt a bit too easy to write into the story. Once they found out what they were doing to the town and what they did to Annie, they invaded the research center, threatened all of the researchers, loaded them into a van, made them take their clothes off, hence why they were neatly folded, and then they were told to go out onto the ice. Beatrice said that if Annie didn't want to take them, then their clothes were there for them when they got back, but obviously she wanted to kill them for what they did. Liz and Evangeline chose to ignore what they did due to the suffering that the town had endured at the hands of the facility and the mining company, and they let them just get away with it. Something which I kind of understand, but I think it loses its sense of realism. There was too much of it throughout season four, with Pete killing Hank and getting away with it, Evangeline killing Wheeler, and the women of the town killing the researchers. Is there even a point in having a police force at this point? They can't solve the crimes, and then when they do, they just let them get away with it. What's interesting about the deaths that occurred and the events that followed after is that it is connected to the supernatural side, but there are also logical explanations too. For example, Annie wanted the scientists to die and took them, but there's a logical explanation in the sense that they froze to death out on the ice. Plus, the same for Raymond. He felt as though Annie was on the other side of the hatch, but it was Blair. So it kind of showed the conflicting side of viewpoints in the town and amongst Liz and Evangeline throughout the entirety of the show. I do have to say though, whenever Liz would react to Evangeline saying that she thought that she could hear something, it did make me laugh because she just looked so fed up by that point. The ending. Right at the end of the episode, we cut to the 12th of May, which was considered the first long day of the year, and it was a way of showing us what happened since the 1st of January, the 15th day of darkness. This felt like a bit of a callback to season one with the fact that it was two officers on a different side of the table video recording and interviewing the main character about a case that occurred in the past. We found out that Hank had been presumed to either have been on the run or had gone missing following Otis Heiss's body being found. The fact that Hank had been following Liz in the build up to actually wanting to take Otis actually went in their favor because it was caught on CCTV and it pinned him to the crime scene more and actually provided evidence in the story. However, another main thing that the show focused on in that moment was the fact that Evangeline hadn't been seen in a long while and nobody knew where she was. With Liz saying that people go to Alaska to escape, some people go looking for something and sometimes they find it, it was very elusive and vague. But I think that was the point. Where did Evangeline go? Was she alive? Was she dead? Was she a ghost in the final moment appearing in front of Liz, showing that maybe Liz could now see the dead? Well, right at the end, Liz looked like she was on holiday with Leah and their relationship was the strongest that it had ever been. And out of the corner of the shot, Evangeline walked into frame. The last we saw her, she walked out onto the ice and based on the three times we've seen people doing that, Julia, the scientists, and Raymond Clark, it normally meant death. But I don't think Evangeline is dead. During the episode, she finally found her true name after being told it by a spirit during one of her visions. So now she was fully understanding of herself and had the answer to the burning question that was inside of her. With its meaning being the return of the sun after the long darkness, I don't think that she would then enter the darkness, which would be death after finding that out. I think she's moved on and is continuing to discover herself. She had no more ties in Ennis due to her sister being dead and Karvik only being a loose relationship. So I think she was happy to move on and continue her life somewhere else. Within Evangeline's place, we saw that there was barely anything there and I think it implied that she'd essentially just moved out. On the stripped bed, there was Holden's teddy which Evangeline must have picked up and kept after Liz threw it while she was drunk a few episodes back. Plus alongside that, there was a phone with a video on where she made Raymond Clark confess to everything, showing that even though Clark was dead, they had every piece of evidence that was needed due to it being a verbal confession meaning that the mining company was most likely going to be brought to its knees. 
So that kind of explains why she released him and allowed him to walk out onto the ice, because she knew that they had all that they needed, plus she wanted him dead. Things that felt a bit rushed and too forced. There were a few things in this episode that felt a bit too coincidental for my liking and felt like they only happened because they needed to develop the plot forward at a rapid pace. So I wasn't really a fan of the fact that the oranges were only appearing because Evangeline's mother liked oranges. I thought there would be a deeper meaning that was connected to them, maybe tying into the symbolic nature of death in TV and film. But the oranges were only there because her mother liked them? I'm guessing it was a way of showing that it was her mother who was speaking to her and reaching out, but we didn't need the repeated visual motif of an orange to get that. I also kind of felt that Evangeline falling down into the cave and this falling too, which just so happened to lead to Raymond Clark being stood there staring directly at them, was a bit too easy and cheap. They're basically implying that if they didn't accidentally fall down there, then they wouldn't have known about any of it and Clark would have still been hiding, so I wasn't a big fan of that. Another thing was Beatrice being the cleaner and spilling her bucket of water at the exact spot where the crack in the floor to the hatch was which led to the tunnel, which then made her go down into it and find out all that was going on, something that ultimately caused her to rally up the troops and then invade the facility. That was something that I just didn't quite buy that much. Pete and Kayla's relationship was something which was turbulent to say the least, but during this finale, with Pete abandoning her again, something which she hated and was the catalyst of their relationship's downfall, she just randomly had a change of heart and was fine with him doing it, and then gave him a kiss. He also said that he'd be all hers moving forward, but right at the end he was still on the force, which would mean that he'd still be in demand, so I don't quite know what he meant by that. But Kayla's change of heart was something that I didn't quite understand, and it felt a bit shoehorned in for the sake of a happy ending. Twist and Shout was a song that Liz Danvers absolutely despised listening to, as it gave her some kind of triggering reaction. And this occurred during this episode again, just like in the first, but I don't feel we ever really got an understanding as to why. She ripped out the entertainment system in the first episode, did it in this finale, and we also saw that she was going to kill Wheeler if Evangeline didn't do it first, something which we didn't truly ever find out why. Was it because of the girlfriend being a ghost present there, or was it because he was abusive and because of what happened to Evangeline's mother being abused and the killer never being found? Was that the reason for her immediate response? I don't know. Anyway, we saw the song Twist and Shout being played in a flashback on the radio in the background on one occasion when Liz was with Holden, but is that enough to make it have a triggering response? To the point where she'd kill somebody because he was whistling it. Plus, also, why was Wheeler whistling it? Yeah, there's still a few questions there. I also feel the importance of the spiral was something which was a bit meh. They created a connection with the Tuttles, incorporated the spiral symbol, and made out like there could have been something going on there. But I'm guessing it was drawn on the researcher's head because it was just the tattoo that Annie Kay had and it was a mark that Blair put there to show that it was in the name of Annie Kay? Maybe? I don't know. It's something that I don't quite get. It just felt like a bit of a cheap way to capture our attention. As the symbol didn't really relate to the way that we remembered it, the fact that the bones were laid out in a spiral, it made me think that there would be a sinister, cult-like edge to its incorporation, but there was just nothing, so I was a bit disappointed with that. Whilst there weren't loads of things that felt rushed, there were just a few that frustrated me a bit and just didn't quite make sense for me. Overall review Overall, I think season 4 was pretty good. I give it like a 6.8 out of 10, so it's above average. It wasn't the best season of the show and it was far from being anywhere near as good as season 1, but I'm tired of comparing it to season 1 because it's just not going to live up to it. However, in terms of detective dramas, it achieved what it needed to. It had twists, it had me constantly guessing what was going to happen, it made me connect with the characters, and it took us on a real journey with a solid ending. One of my favourite things about this season, and the finale specifically, was the environment. They made it feel so haunting, frightening, and like you had to fight against nature to survive. So much so that it was almost a character in the show that was going against the leads. The sound of the wind was something that I thought was also incredible. For a brief moment, I felt like the calling that people heard before going out onto the ice and dying was the wind, and the almost calling nature of it, because it blended in so well with the voices that Evangeline was hearing. One of the best moments for me during the finale was the scene that took place between Liz and Evangeline in front of the fire where Evangeline told Liz that she saw Holden and he said that he could see her. I really felt the pain that Liz had in that moment and the mourning and grief that she was going through having never really gotten over the death of her son. 
Something I will say though, it feels like she couldn't care less about Jake being dead. Not once did she ever think about him or have visions of him, so that was definitely interesting. Was I a fan of the Supernatural Edge? Uh, I was until I wasn't, that's what I'd say. I quite liked the supernatural side that it had, but it was just kind of ambiguous at the end, which does lean into the whole supernatural side of things. But all of the dead that were pointing towards Evangeline and the seeing of the dead didn't really amount to much in my opinion. Clark could see the dead, but he just seemed like he had some issues with his mental state by the end, so it's hard to ever truly know just how real it was. Rose said at the start of the show that the dead want one of three things when they appear. To tell you something, to take you away, or to just visit you. And it feels like Julia was taken, but Evangeline was told something. Her true name. So maybe there weren't bad intentions there at all. I don't know. In terms of the identity behind the placing of Annie's tongue in the Salal research facility and Clark not being responsible, the researchers not, and Beatrice not either, I think that's just making a point that not all cases get solved with every answer being known. It was similar in the season one finale as not everybody was caught. With regards to the tongue, the likes of Hank could have done it and placed it there, or maybe even the people from Silver Sky Mining. The way Beatrice said that it wasn't part of her story, it does make me think that it could actually well have been. But there was no point in holding on to details like that when the main parts of the case were solved. Another thing that was similar to that was who wrote We Are All Dead on the whiteboard? Was it the women after taking the researchers as they knew what was happening in the town, so could it have been a message implying that they were aware and that they were killing everybody? Or was it Raymond Clark after he'd emerged from the tunnel underground? He did say that he was initially down there for maybe an hour, and we know that he emerged from time to time as he was spotted by the delivery guy, so maybe it was him who wrote on the whiteboard in reference to the fact that he was seeing the dead. One moment that was really small in the finale, but I quite liked, was the final shot of Pete. We saw some great moments in this episode of him being numb to what was going on with regards to him having killed his father and cleaning up the blood, and then having to put the body in the water himself. The final shot of Pete was him lying in bed with his son and having a smile, but there was a moment of realization there. The realization that he killed his father and that he'd have to live with that every day. Just like what Rose said, the hard part had just begun. He once sat alongside his father like his son was alongside him there, just harmless. But obviously, we know how that ended. I think Jodie Foster and Callie Reese had a good connection throughout the show, and it definitely got better with time. It's no Rust and Marty, don't get me wrong, but Danvers and Navarro were enjoyable to watch for sure. You could tell that they'd been through a lot together, and the differences between them allowed their relationship to flourish and to feel a bit more authentic. Would I recommend this season of True Detective? Well, yeah, I would. For the most part, it's a great season of TV. I think it does have some issues with the ending, but it's not a bad ending by any means. It's unique in its approach, it's original, and whilst not as good as the first season, I think it is a good season of TV. So, there you have it. True Detective Season 4, Episode 6, Ending Explained. I just want to say a massive thanks for tuning into the True Detective videos that I've been putting out every week. It's been great fun covering the show and chatting theories with all of you guys. Be sure to stick around on the channel as I'll be doing some videos on True Detective over the course of the next week so you can still get your fix of the show. Plus, if you are missing Season 1, then I've done two videos recently on Season 1, why it was perfect and also a breakdown inside the mind of Errol Childress. Yeah, I went to those dark realms. So if you're interested in those, then they'll be on the screen now. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.